Hey guys, and welcome to Unit 5 of AP World History. In this unit, we have a brand new time period. We're going to be looking at about 1700 to 1900, or what we call the modern period of world history. Our main focus for this unit is going to be specifically on some intellectual changes that happen in the world and how they are going to affect not only politics, but also society, and also economics in ways that perhaps the kind of original intellectual thinkers may not have had up their sleeve. And so we're gonna have about five lectures online that are gonna cover this entire unit. And so we're gonna cover first the Enlightenment, today's subject. We're then gonna look at some political revolutions and effects of the Enlightenment on politics across the world. This is where we get to jump into things like the American Revolution, the French Revolution, Haitian Revolution, and a lot of revolutions across the world. And then we're gonna transition and we're gonna look at how do these changes lead to some economic effects Things like the Industrial Revolution that have technological and infrastructure change across the world. And then we're going to wrap up this unit by looking at what are the effects of all these things on society. How do politics shape the way that societies are altering and kind of adjusting? And then how does the Industrial Revolution affect the way that society looks across the globe? With that, let's get into it. So the first thing we really want to talk about before we jump into the Enlightenment itself is what other intellectual movements preceded the Enlightenment before we get to this moment that's really going to kickstart the 18th and 19th century for us in world history. So if we take ourselves way back into units one, two, three, four, we know that primarily up until this point, the large portion of world history that really matters is happening in Asia and in the Middle East. <clears throat> and so what we're going to see with this unit is that all of the developments, especially intellectually, that happen in the Middle East and in Asia make their way to Europe. And it's in this little cauldron of all these different European nations that these intellectual ideas take off and spring into something brand new. And so that's where we're going to begin today. Dating back all the way to unit one, we're talking about Dar al-Islam and this territory that is controlled by Muslims who are procuring and kind of preserving a lot of the knowledge that was classical in nature. So we're talking about Greek and Roman and kind of these thoughts and ideas from the past that are from the kind of Western European world, but they get lost during the Dark Ages. Now, the first intellectual movement that we're going to talk about that comes as a result of all of the new classical information philosophy, ideas that are coming out of the Middle East is the European Renaissance. Now let's take a complicated term like the Renaissance and try and simplify it. Renaissance just means rebirth. So when we think about the European Renaissance as a whole, all it really is is a rebirth of the culture that had existed previously and put, for the lack of a better term, on steroids. And so the Renaissance itself becomes a movement that is primarily concerned with placing European culture at its peak. We're gonna take its culture and really bring it out of the cellars and demonstrate how amazing European culture can be. For those of us that love art <laughs> that is born out of the Enlightenment, I do apologize that we're not covering it in more depth than potentially we could. The focus for today though really is on the Enlightenment. So it's important to understand the fact that the Renaissance is this first moment that really leads to potential further intellectual movements, specifically in Europe. The second intellectual movement that is going to be born out of this classical knowledge that is brought to Europe is the scientific revolution. And the scientific revolution, as it sounds, is a movement that is going to place science at the forefront of the way that Europeans view everything in terms of their relationship, not only with the universe itself, which is big enough, but also with their relationship with the church and later on with politics. Now the scientific revolution is absolutely transformative in the way that it is going to alter the European intellectual and cultural trajectory for the 17th and 18th centuries. So what we're talking about is intellectually and culturally, Europe's gonna change drastically as a result of the scientific revolution. Now the question becomes, how and why. And so one of the fundamental keys of the scientific revolution is the idea that knowledge is acquired through rational inquiry and reason. So you are able to understand things about the world that you live in because you're able to see it and observe it 
and through using reason or rational thought as a way to get to those conclusions. And so what this is going to do is it's gonna have widespread implications for the way that people view their place in the universe. Let's look at some examples now of how the scientific revolution really takes off. Our first stop on a scientific revolution tour is with our Polish mathematician and astronomer, Nicolaus Copernicus. Now in 1543, Copernicus is gonna write a book called On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. And while that might not sound like a page turner, at the time, Copernicus comes up with the idea that at the center of all things lies the sun. For us in the 21st century, that's a pretty obvious statement that the sun is at the heart of our solar system. But this is actually a huge challenge to the way that humans at this time viewed their place in the universe. At this point, everyone had believed fundamentally that the earth was the center of all things, that mankind was the center of this heavenly sphere of planets. And for Copernicus to come in and say, nope, it's the sun, we're just one of the other planets on the orbit, is a pretty drastic change and a challenge to the Catholic Church at this time. Stop number two is with the Italian astronomer Galileo. Now, in 1609, Galileo starts to use a telescope to observe the nature of the cosmos, the way that these planets are going to orbit and function in relation to one another. And as he does so, he's realizing pretty quickly that there are some established ideas about the, the order of planets and the way that Earth itself fits into this that is just fundamentally wrong. Now, he gets into a little bit of trouble with this and has to actually get called to court and is tried for these type of observations that he is making. Now, that's not to say that Galileo is not a good Christian at heart. Galileo fundamentally believes that these scientific ideas coexist with the idea of Christianity. And yet, one of the biggest backlashes against Galileo is from the Catholic Church themselves. Our final stop on the Scientific Revolution tour occurs with a man and his apple. And Sir Isaac Newton, who is an Englishman, whether it's a true story or not, is said to have been sitting underneath an apple tree one day when an apple hits him on the head. And he is instantly enlightened by the idea that gravity fundamentally has a balance between not only the earthly but heavenly forces. And so there's this idea of universal gravitation that is going to exist pretty much unchallenged until the 21st century. And so Sir Isaac Newton, like the other scientific kind of members who are a part of this revolution, is drastically changing the way in which humans, especially Europeans, are viewing their place within the universe not to put too broad of a stroke on the scientific revolution, but like the Renaissance, the scientific revolution really is important because it's a movement that is intellectual in its core, but it's also really going to change the way that Europeans think about the world around them, which leads to then an entire movement, the enlightenment, that's gonna really have a lot of implications for the rest of the world outside of Europe as we move forward. Now, before I get too many of y'all scratching your heads saying, okay, I get the scientific revolution, I understand the Renaissance, but we're talking about the Enlightenment and you haven't told me what the Enlightenment is. Well, the Enlightenment is actually a incredibly simple idea, but as a movement, it becomes much more complicated. And so the Enlightenment itself, especially in Europe, is a group of intellectual thinkers who believe fundamentally that the power of knowledge is able to transform human society. And these people who are going to have this belief are called philosophs. And so philosoph, it's a fancy word for philosopher, but when we're talking about the group of people, especially in the enlightenment, they have a little bit of a fancy twist to their name. And so when we're talking about this group, there's a lot of things that keep them in common outside of just their belief that using knowledge, using the kind of tools that are, have been carried over from the scientific revolution and the Renaissance can lead to human perfectibility or the improvement and progress of human society. So here are some of the big ideas that we have to understand about the philosophers. Like we said, they are primarily gonna exist within the 18th century, so we're talking about the 1700s. They're intellectual thinkers and philosophers who are influenced heavily by the scientific revolution. 
And they're using reason and nature, the laws that govern nature, to then try and fix the issues that they see within human society. This is the big thing. You're taking the ideas of the scientific revolution, but putting it on human affairs and human society to make it better. Now, naturally, this is gonna bring a lot of the philosophers within a little bit of conflict, not only with established governments, but also with established authority as a whole, which means the church. And so one of the unique things about philosophs is that many of them are what we call deists. And deists are a group of people who believe there is a God, there is a deity who presided over the creation of earth, and then he just left it alone. Now, the really good analogy for this is that God is a clockmaker. He makes a clock, he makes it fancy, it's got the little bird that pops out at the hour, and it's gonna run on its own. But once the clockmaker's done making his clock, he leaves it alone, and he lets it do its thing. And so deists believe that there is a God who presided over the creation of everything, but he's ultimately not been involved in anything, and that helps explain a lot of the negative and kind of potential issues that have been existing within human history. So now let's talk really briefly about what are some of the ideologies or ideas that are percolating within the philosophs head during the Enlightenment. And so the Enlightenment at its core has this belief in progress that's gonna govern everything that they have as a potential solution or way of improving human society. Progressivism is fundamentally tied to the Enlightenment. From this progressivism, it is really gonna be governed by two main other isms that really help us explain the Enlightenment, rationalism and empiricism. Now, rationalism is actually quite simple. Rationalism is just this belief that you can use human reason to solve a lot of problems. You can use rational or logical thought to solve potential problems. That's all that is. So let's stop potentially allowing these outside influences to help govern human decision-making processes and really focus on just rational human thought. Now empiricism though is a little bit trickier, so let's dive into that. Empiricism stems directly from the scientific revolution. And so empirical data or empirical thought is the idea that if you can observe a pattern, you can then measure it and it is reasonable and rational to follow that conclusion. So if I can observe something, that allows me to use empirical data to demonstrate a fact. Now it might seem simple, but empiricism really is a scientific form of observation or using the scientific method to solve problems. If I can observe findings, measure that data, it allows me to then solve these problems through the use of science in ways that has previously not been done. So when you pair empiricism and rationalism, you have a really potent way of looking at problems across society. Now let's take these two ideas of rationalism and empiricism, which really do seem focused primarily on scientific issues, but apply it to one of the main complaints of the philosophers themselves, which is what we call the hereditary right of kings, or the idea that just because my dad was king means that I then get to be king when he dies. And so the philosophers themselves, as we'll see throughout the variety of revolutions that take place, look at this finding and say, I see nowhere in nature does it say that just because one person's father was in charge means that you were then fit to be in charge. And so this type of conclusion, this type of use of rational thought mixed with observation deeply put in nature can help lead to some political change as we will see, especially in places like France and in the United States. Now, while we're on the subject of the British American colonies, let's talk about the major effects of the Enlightenment on not only Unit 5 as a whole of the modern period of world history, but also just on global societies as a whole. As we begin to see philosophical changes in Europe take place as a result of the Enlightenment, there are gonna be political revolutions that occur across the globe, but especially in Europe, against these ideas that have been in place for some time now that the enlightened people are now thinking, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So we'll get the American Revolution. We have revolutions in France and across the globe that are sparked by these political enlightenment ideas. But that's not the only effect of the enlightenment. The Enlightenment does lead to political revolutions globally, 
but it's also going to lead to changes in the way that people view their own place within their nation or their society. One of the most obvious examples is going to be over the 19th and especially into the 20th century, you're gonna see calls for civil rights and for equal rights, not only from women, but also from minority groups across the spectrum. And so the enlightenment is going to lead to these ideas that everyone is potentially endowed with the same rights that everyone else is born with. You think back to a document like the Declaration of Independence, which fundamentally says, all men are created equal. And when you say all men are created equal, people tend to take you seriously on that. And so as these Enlightenment ideas begin to spread, and it does take some time, we're gonna see that really, the Enlightenment does not really have limits to its effects on global society. So as you can tell, the Enlightenment is actually a pretty simple stopping point for us. And it's a quick little lecture that we have, and that's actually pretty nice every now and then, because as we get into the American, French, Haitian revolutions, I like to talk about those, and so they'll be a little bit longer. And so the big thing for us today, though, is that we understand that the Enlightenment itself, preceded by the scientific revolution, preceded by the Renaissance, is going to really reshape the way that Europeans view their place within European society, view their place within the globe itself, but also within the universe, and really try to reshape the way that all of that fits together. And so as we move into the latter part of this unit, you'll see the Enlightenment stands at the center of it all. This is the spark, the match, that's really gonna light this keg, that's gonna change the way the world looks as we move into the modern period. Thanks again for being here, guys. Appreciate y'all. See y'all in class. Bye-bye.